item uh, for enthusiastically picking up this idea and converting it into the official item for uh, And of course, as like I said, people who actually do all work. And uh, with that, uh, I would like to move forward and introduce the first speaker, uh, who is uh, Terry, and he will talk about quantum simulations of spin to meet audience with arrays of represent. Thanks. So, morning, everybody. So, it's a great pleasure for me to be here, and I'd like to thank Misha uh, and his team for uh, organizing this uh, event. So, it's true that Antoine started the, the thing. Um, <coughs> so, I will talk about, uh, so, we, my title is uh, Quantum Simulation of Spin Hamiltonians in Array of Single Drug Atoms. Recent results, work in progress, and new tools, because I think in the spirit of this workshop, the idea was really to discuss like, work in progress and new things that are um, um, being done in the lab. So it's not uh, fully only and understood yet, but uh, I think it's, it's actually the, the nicest thing to discuss. OK, so uh, this work is done in the group of Antoine uh, Moway, uh, and the people who are really working hard in the lab are uh, Sikram and uh, Vincent, PhD students, and Daniel, uh, our postdoc, and they are really uh, great in the lab. OK, so uh, most of you know uh, what kind of experimental platform we use. We have arrays of optical tweezers in which we drop individual items. And uh, we are able to create arbitrary two-dimensional no, arrays of up to 50 uh, single atoms. So the spacing between the atoms is a few micrometers. And so to get some uh, decent interactions between the atoms, you need to excite them to real work states. And for the states we use, the typical interaction strengths on the order of a few megahertz at a few micrometers. Uh, and in the last years, uh, what we've been doing with this platform is to uh, implement uh, spin Hamiltonians, uh, so we need some kind of analog quantum simulator, if you wish, uh, because with this system it's very natural to uh, map this on a, on a IT like uh, spin Hamiltonian if you use uh, on about interactions, or uh, on an XY spin exchange Hamiltonian uh, if you use the resonance dipole layer. But of course, uh, since March, around, I have to say that this is also in principle a nice platform for doing quantum gates. Okay, so the outline of my talk will be the following. So I will still have a little uh, summary, so to say, of our setup and what we've done recently. Uh, and then I will spend most of the time uh, describing really recent uh, things that were going on in the lab. Uh, in particular, we have now a better understanding of uh, experimental imperfections both at the uh, single particle level and at the level of interacting particles uh, which give hope that in fact uh, the system can be a really decent uh, quantum simulator of spin one half uh, systems uh, and also I will describe some uh, recent tools, uh, new tools that were implemented uh, in, in, the, in the lab that hopefully will be useful uh, for uh, quantum simulations in the future. Okay, so uh, the first uh, thing in our setup is to prepare two dimensional arrays of single atoms. And uh, so this is a sketch of our setup. We have high numerical aperture lenses uh, under vacuum. Um, and uh, with that, we can create uh, optical vision with a wave of about a micrometer. And we load single atoms from a mod uh, in these uh, optical pieces. Uh, so now to, to get several traps, what we do we use a spatial light modulator. We print a phase on the traveling beam, and then in the focal plane here of the lens, we've got the, the diffraction pattern corresponding to this uh, phase modulated uh, electric field. And if you wish to the appropriate phase, then you can get pretty much any uh, geometry you want for your uh, values uh, optical pieces and then you detect the fluorescence of the atoms uh, when you shine resonant light, or quasi-resonant light on those atoms. And, uh, <coughs> so this is basically the setup. Uh, a small uh, side note also is that inside the vacuum chamber, we have uh, perfect control of the electric field. Uh, we have eight independent electrodes uh, that allow us to, to apply electric fields along the arbitrary directions. 
So with this setup, we can, uh, as I said, by changing the face we print on the traveling beam, we can create pretty much any uh, pattern we want. And here you have some examples. So, and here, for example, you have a pretty large arrays with up to 100 tweezers. And uh, you can trap single atoms in those arrays and you get those nice images. But here I have to say that those images are like average over a long time, because if you look at any given time, all, each tweezer has a probability one half of containing one atom, and, and otherwise it's empty. So uh, this is clearly a limitation. And uh, to, to overcome that, what we do is uh, we implement uh, a bit like uh, what is done here uh, in Michel's lab, um, some active sorting uh, of these uh, configurations. So imagine, for example, you start from a square six by six array of optical tweezers, which are shown here by those little red squares. Uh, you load atoms in this array, and then you get some random configuration where you have about half of the traps which are loaded. So these are these little uh, white dots here. And now the idea is to say, OK, I will select the subarray of this uh, bigger array, uh, which I will call the target array. And I will uh, use the atoms that are not inside uh, this, uh, this target array to fill in the vacancies in this uh, target array to, to end up in this uh, nicely ordered configuration. And so to do that, uh, we use again an optical tweezers uh, which we can move. So here on the on the tracking uh, setup, we superimpose these extra moving tweezers, uh, which is uh, controlled both in position and intensity with a 2D acoustic deflector. And then we can, uh, from images taken by, by this camera, uh, run a, a computer which will implement the moves that you need to have to, to, to do this atom by atom uh, assembly of, of this target array. So it, it works like that. So if you want to end up having n atoms in a, in a regular array, what we do? We start by having a bigger array of about 2n traps. Then it's very quickly filled with on the order of n atoms. And we take an initial fluorescence image to know where the atoms are. Okay, so this will vary. It's completely stochastic, so this will vary from shot to shot. And then on the fly, pretty quickly, we have an algorithm which calculates all the moves that you need to implement to end up in a uh, desired configuration. And then, uh, with this acoustic deflector, we do this fast series of moves. And at the end, we get a final image to check that indeed the thing worked or not. Um, and so here, for example, you have an image of the, so this is the initial configuration. This is the final one. And here, it's, this is not an image of atoms. It's just the light that is used for, for doing this thing. So the, the dots that you see are the, 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 all the traps. And here you see maybe uh, some uh, traces that go from one track to the other. And this is just a long exposure of all those moves that were done one after the other. OK, and so uh, in the lab, it's, it's really done like that. So this is just a, a screen uh, capture of the, of the computer in the lab. So here you have a big matrix, 10 by 10. You have all those uh, traps. And we have this subarray of 7 by 7 uh, traps that we want to completely fill. And so, um, so this is uh, taken in real time. And uh, you see that at some point it poses because just the, the computer triggers the assembly sequence and it takes successively uh, an initial image. So you see that it changes uh, from shot to shot. It's never the same. And then this image after sorting, so we see that it's almost always fully loaded. From time to time, you have one or two holes. And then we do rejoin physics in this, in this experiment. So we have a final third image, uh, which tells us after reperoxidation, uh, which atoms are still in their traps. And actually, the atoms that are missing on those images, it's because they have been excited to reperoxidate. OK, so it's actually, when you're in the lab, it's quite fascinating to stay uh, in front of the computer and just like, look whether you see, for example, correlations uh, between the position of those the holes. Uh, in, this, uh, in this final image. Okay, so here you have a little gallery of the kind of uh, fully loaded arrays that uh, we have done. And uh, so the, the performance is, is, is pretty good. We can have like from 98 or 96% in fraction at the repetition rate of the order of one hertz or so. Um, 
of course, we have this intermediate image that tells us uh, what was the configuration. So we can, if needed, we can really select only those runs where the array was fully loaded. So if you want to have some data for a number of atoms, this is something we can do. Um, and so, yeah, so this is, a, this is something uh, nice to start and do some many-body physics. But for that, of course, we need interactions. And so uh, we spent quite some time to try and understand in details the interactions between the group states. And so concerning the excitation, we do a very standard uh, type of photon excitation uh, with an intermediate unit here for the T5P1 state. So we use a video. Um, and for most of the experiments I will uh, present you, we use uh, these three half states for several reasons. Um, and so here, for example, you have an experiment where we just do a single atom radio oscillation from the ground state to the wave gap state. So it's, uh, I mean, it's not too bad, there, but there is a little bit of damping and it's not perfect. And this is something that uh, we've worked on to understand those limitations. So, uh, and the typical uh, radio frequency for those radio oscillations is on the order of, uh, of 1 megahertz. Vary a little bit, of course, but this is the typical numbers. Then, for some other experiments, <coughs> we use a pair of Rydberg states, so for example, the 62D and 63P, um, and we uh, encode the spin in this, uh, this Rydberg uh, manifold. And uh, then the coherent manipulation is much easier because you just need to have a low power uh, microwave source, and then you can have really nice and almost not damped uh, radio stations. So, uh, how do you guys detect this? Mm -hmm. How are this? How do you detect? Yeah, what is the detection? Uh, so, for the detection, we have to rely on optical de excitation. So, basically, for example, if you bring the atom to a 63P uh, and then we send some de excitation dots, uh, the atom is lost. Whereas, if it's in 62D, we have a high probability to recapture it. But of course, this is not perfect. And this is basically a explaining the finite contrast uh, that we have here. Okay, so so much for uh, single uh, Rydberg uh, excitation. So, but now the interesting part, of course, is these interactions. And what's nice about Rydberg is that you have these two regimes, you can have the Mandelas uh, type of interaction, but also the resonant uh, dipole dipole interaction, where you prepare a pair of atoms in different uh, Rydberg states and they can exchange their internal states uh, coherently <coughs> with, uh, with this 1 over RQ uh, interaction. And when you talk in terms of spin Hamiltonians, uh, this, is, uh, this is a direct implementation of the XY Hamiltonian. And, and here in the Van der Waals case, uh, you can map this onto, onto an Ising-like uh, model. Uh, there are some, some extra little details, but essentially it's like the Ising model. And so, uh, over the, la the last few years, we did lots of experiments in very simple but clean systems with just two atoms that control position, control distance, and angles, and so on, and to measure really uh, precisely uh, the positions, I mean, the, the interaction as a function of distance, both in the Van der Waals and in the resonant dipole dipole regime. We also need to first the resonances, and this is something we have summarized uh, uh, in, in a small review in this, uh, in this paper. Okay. So uh, now we have all the ingredients. We have those arrays of atoms. We think that we understand interactions between Rydberg, so we can start to do some kind of uh, many-body physics. <coughs> and the first thing to do, of course, is to observe the Rydberg blockade. So this is uh, something that we can do in a mesoscopic ensembles and really control the number of atoms. So here uh, you have a single atom radio oscillation. Now you do the same kind of thing, but with two atoms very close by, and you see that the probability to have just one nuclear oxidation as a function of time oscillates nicely in a coherent way, but faster. If you increase the atom number, the association gets even faster. But uh, the probability to get two or even more nuclear oxidations remains uh, really small. So this is, uh, this is basically the textbook uh, Rydberg blockade. And of course, you can uh, see the scaling of this uh, rabbit frequency with the atom number. And it scales nicely with with the number of atoms. Uh, but of course, so this is somehow, uh, I mean, it's, it's, of course, 
very nice, but uh, you can do something which is more oriented towards uh, many body physics uh, with the same setup, but just by changing the size of the relative size of the blockade radius with respect to the to the world array. And so, for example, uh, what we did was to use this kind of one D chain with uh, parallel boundary conditions, and to do some uh, excitation in a regime where the blockade radius, is, I mean the blockade volume, is, is shown here. So it's smaller than the size of the system. It's not a sphere because we are using these states and we have anisotropic interactions. Uh, and then you have this kind of Eiffel um, um, model in the transverse field, uh, and you can study different uh, observables, like for example, what is the magnetization <laughs> that you get in the system when you just switch on your lasers, so if you have quantum crunch. Uh, so this is a global observable, it's a total number of Rydberg uh, atoms in the chain, but you can also look uh, spin spin correlation functions, uh, as a function of the distance between the waves. And uh, here you see some nice uh, oscillations at the beginning and then some kind of uh, dephasing, but this is due to, to the fact that there are many other systems with many ion frequencies. And uh, you can also uh, see the correlation function, you can really see a strong, see a strong expression uh, of the, this uh, pair correlation function for uh, sizes smaller than the blockade radius, so this is what you expect, and then you see some kind of oscillation before reaching one. So you start to have some kind of liquid light correlations. And uh, what was kind of uh, amazing to us, uh, Thomas O'Malley, <coughs> that some of you know very well, uh, did some calculations for, for us, and uh, actually, so this is here the, the solid lines. This is the result of uh, simulation of the Schrodinger equation for this uh, 20 particle uh, system um, without any adjustable parameter, just <coughs> plugging the, the, the experimental parameters that we measure in the energy, and it fits really very well. So this is, uh, this is very nice, and this uh, gives the impression that yes, maybe you're a very nice quantum simulator uh, for this uh, for this. Um, However, uh, in some situations, you do exactly the same procedure and uh, what you observe, so here, so we have this little ring of eight atoms, or this big uh, matrix of, uh, so in that case we had like 49 traps, but just 30 atoms at the time that we still had the random loading. And you look at the magnetization as a function of time, and at short times it's well reproduced by this uh, Schrodinger equation simulation. But at long times, clearly, there, there is a big discrepancy. And you have an excess of Rydberg atoms uh, as compared to what is predicted by a single uh, simple model where you have a spin one half, where the spin down is, uh, is the atom in the ground state and spin up is the atom in the red state. So in this paper, we still had some kind of evidence that this was due to uh, several, uh, I mean, to the fact that when you use these rehab states, you have lots of Zeman sub-levels and so on involved. Uh, but we have no, like, clear cut uh, proof that this was the case, and this is a very recent development uh, that I want to, to share with you, that uh, now we, we have some, some good understanding of this, uh, this thing. So this brings me to the second part, which is uh, new stuff uh, that we have understood. So uh, first thing I want to say is that at a particular level, uh, I've shown you some radio oscillations between ground state and regular state. It's not perfectly contrasted, it's not undamped, I'd say it's damped. And uh, now we understand better why uh, this is so, and when I say better, I mean in a quantitative way. So here I've shown you a, a typical radio oscillation that you can get in the lab, so for, for this very state here. And if you try to fit this, for example, with a, with a damped Time wave, you will find a 1 over e damping time of the order of 5 microseconds or something like that. It may vary a bit from experiment to experiment, but this is a typical time scale. And actually, I guess uh, from uh, an email by uh, Sylvain, who also sort of triggered uh, this workshop, uh, that this is what you guys here have observed also. Uh, Jerry, what's the temperature for this data? So, here the typical temperature is on the order of 30 microkelvin. So, um, so we, so I mean, this is something we've lived with uh, for for a long time, and I mean, we can still do some physics, but it would be interesting to, to understand in detail where this comes from to try and improve on that. And uh, following also the visit in our lab of uh, Mike 
Mahdi, uh, who came from uh, Sandia to spend one, one and a half week with, with us. We started to really put members uh, to some kind of aero budget. And uh, if you start to uh, put together the Doppler effect, the spontaneous emission from the intermediate state, because we have a finite detuning, of course, uh, and also the phase noise of the blue and red lasers, uh, plus some small imperfection in the preparation and detection, it starts to uh, be comparable uh, to what we observe, at least for relatively short times. Uh, for longer times, we, we seem to observe a bit more damping, uh, and we think at the moment, but this is something that we try to explore, that this may have to do with a uh, shot to shot fluctuation in the uh, intensity of our uh, later okay, So, this is something. That, I mean, it's easy to put in the model, but uh, what we want to do is we to measure first and say, okay, this is the kind of integrations we have, and now we put it in the model and let's see whether it fits. Sort of uh, easy starship grades, uh, spectral gradients. <clears throat> so, so on those experiments, uh, we are using just one single atom, so uh, and, and we take care of uh, really uh, so so we'll have just one light chip. And then we take care to compensate for it by the detuning of the laser. But, uh, now, of course, if you have a big array, uh, you have inhomogeneities in the, in the, in the array, because the, both the red and blue gravity frequency depend on position. And I mean, I cannot really give you an answer because it's really dependent being on, on the conditions. And if we do a really big array, uh, but, but it can be seen. So this is how over there? Here? Yeah. No, this is a single one, atom, just one atom. So of course, now with a big array, you cannot, I mean, you cannot do the compensation everywhere. So yeah, so, so this was just a kind of a quick teaser, and I'm not uh, giving you any details, but uh, tomorrow uh, I guess we'll, we'll have more time to discuss more details. Okay, so now coming to the imperfections in these uh, in, in the interactions, and especially when you try to model the system by this p one half. Uh, in fact, due to the fact that you have many levels in, uh, in real states, uh, that's a strength, but that's also a weakness uh, for some applications, and in particular, this can bring so, some, some breakdown of the ripple blockade, and there are in many uh, studies of, of this, of all the effects you can think of. Um, and in fact, uh, for these states, one of the obvious effects is that, uh, well, for one atom, you will have uh, four Zeman cell levels. So now if you have two atoms, that's already uh, 16 uh, pair states. And uh, strictly speaking, when, you, when those atoms are interacting via the Van der Waals interaction, the Van der Waals interaction is a big 16 by 16 matrix. Uh, so if your two atoms are aligned along the quantization axis, uh, it's no problem because you have no population <coughs> since you are using uh, Basically, it's a matrix is a block diagonal, and you can reinforce on just one element. Uh, but as soon as you have an angle between the quantization axis and, uh, and the digital nuclear axis, uh, you, you have to deal with that. So of course, I mean, if you want to do many body physics, you don't want to, to carry on this uh, big uh, complexity with you. So the very simple best approach that you can think of is say, OK, maybe this will uh, sort of average and give some kind of annual dependent uh, C6 coefficient. So this is something that we had actually measured a few years ago. Uh, we were trying to, to, to measure the interaction between two atoms at the given angle uh, for both S states and D states, and we were trying to have a kind of effective C6 coefficient. And uh, we got those, those results here showing this kind of anisotropy, which gives this strange shape to the blockade volumes I was showing before. And so this was at the time when we did the experiment, it was purely empirical, and we did this. Uh, as a simple-minded experimentalist, but then uh, in Innsbruck, uh, Benoit Dermerge and uh, Alex Lopez, uh, they, they, they did a nice theory of that and showed that, yes, it's a valid description when you are in the blockaded regime somehow. So, so it's nice, but of course it's not a full story. So, and in, in particular, uh, when you add a magnetic field, which you always have in your experiment, um, you can have some uh, strange things happening. So for example, if the Van der Waals uh, interaction uh, and the Zeeman shifts have opposite signs, 
uh, then you can have some distances for which you have a breakdown of locate because uh, your lasers will still be resonant uh, with the atoms that are uh, close enough because uh, you will cover to all the seven states. So uh, they were calling these uh, magic distances. Uh, in our experiment, in the experiments I've shown you, uh, we should not observe that because we are in the safe uh, regime where the uh, Zeeman shifts and the Van der Waals uh, interaction at the same time. So in principle, this effect should not occur. But in fact, uh, so in our experiment, we compensate any two fields, but we are never uh, perfectly compensating it. And um, in fact, uh, Sebastian Weber, who is working uh, in Stuttgart in Hans Peter Fischer's group, um, he has developed a very nice uh, tool that actually is available uh, online uh, to compute uh, pair interactions uh, for, for realistic, I mean, with, with a lot of details, and in particular with B field and E field. And he did calculations for, 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 for example, if you take two really atoms with an angle which is, uh, which is uh, in that case, 77 degrees, something we had on the experiment, um, <coughs> and uh, we, we, if you say, okay, uh, so our exper experimental B field is 70 hours, and we thought we had uh, no electric fields, we calculate the interactions, this is what you get. So this is the interaction as a function of distance. And you can see that you have a nice main line and you just have a little bit of talking to all the line. But as soon as you apply a little electric field, then you start to have a lot of couplings to other uh, states. And uh, in that case, it's because you have to realize that uh, for n equals 60, this is for n equals 61, and we are actually not very far from the first resonance. So you have a lot of effect of electric fields. But even for other uh, quantum numbers, uh, when of the D state, which is not huge uh, for D state. And so uh, even away from first resonances, uh, those kind of maps are really uh, like. And so Sebastian uh, was in, in our institute for one, one week or so, and uh, one day he told us, well, I've run my simulation and so on, and maybe you should just go back to the lab and do the same experiments as you did uh, one year ago. But instead of having uh, six gauss and maybe a small electric field that you might have had uh, in your experiment, uh, try to compensate the, the, the electric field better and change also uh, your, your B field to 3.5 Gauss, it should be better. And we did, and it was much, much better. Okay, so it's not perfectly perfect agreement with, with, the, with the spin one half model, but it's, I mean, it's clearly much, much better. So uh, and, and the, the, so then you can see this in, in two different ways. Either you can say, okay, it's good news, we have solved the problem. You can also say, okay, it's in some sense it tells you that you have to be really careful about all the parameters. You have to, and, and it turns out that the safe region in parameter space, when you uh, look what angles, what uh, principal quantum numbers and so on are allowed, in the end they are a bit small and just to illustrate that, you, if we go there, but just change again the field to 7 Gauss now, then you, we start to again see this kind of diffusion to other uh, level. But still, I would say that it's, it's good news. We, we, there are some situations where we can really have a nice, uh, a nice agreement with the, with the, with the spin one and one. So here, the, the, the curve is not exactly the same because in those experiments, now we are using our atom assembler. So it's, it's really a fully loaded uh, 7 by 7 arrays, so like, and the, the, also the blockade radius is to be This is why the curve here is not in the same thing. Just a small thing. Okay, so, uh, so it seems that it's uh, not uh, out of the question to do some interesting quantum simulations with this system. And so it's always good on the experiment for some, some nice tools to, to play with the atoms. So we've uh, started to implement a few new tools on, on the system. And uh, one of the things we've done recently, so this was put on the archive, uh, I don't know, two weeks ago or so, is to implement the local control of the uh, resonant dipole light interaction by using light shield. So it's, uh, it's really simple, um, but it's, it 
I think it will be good. So, um, so now I'm not interested anymore in the Van der interaction, but more in the uh, resonant dipole dipole interaction. So I will consider this spin down and spin up here. And uh, if I uh, prepare my system in this state up down, uh, due to the dipole dipole interaction, I will have a resonant exchange uh, between the two states up down and down. And this is something we have measured in a small system or of two and then three atoms uh, in this paper. So this is a very nice interaction because it's very strong also as compared to, uh, uh, to the Van der Waals interaction. Uh, it's um, something, I mean, everything happens in the linear manifold, so somehow you can switch off your lasers, which is always good, you can suffer from phase noise and so on. But the problem is that it's always hot. So now if you, if you want at some point, for example, to freeze your system to do some measurements which take time or whatever, uh, this is a limitation. So, uh, so what we, we did what, was to say, okay, let's have something to, for the switch to switch it on and off. And the idea is very, very simple. It's called resonant dipole-dipole interaction because uh, the two states up, down, and down, up are degenerate. But now if you manage to uh, change selectively the energy of one of those two linear states here uh, locally, uh, then the pair is not resonant anymore, and so you will be uh, Right. You, have, you still have the coupling, but you are not resonant, so there are almost no effect. So to do that, uh, you have to apply a selective light shift on one of the big dark states, so for example on the 61D, but you don't want to apply any shift on the uh, 62D, 62P, sorry. And so this you can do uh, easily by uh, coupling this D state here, for example, to the 61 half state. So for that you need a, a laser at uh, 10.05 nanometer. Uh, which, uh, which is not really too hard. And uh, then uh, what you can, so this is uh, how we do one. We, we have our setup here. We have those two lenses facing each other. And on one of the atoms here, we will be shining this, uh, this laser. And uh, so the first thing we did, of course, is to measure that, yes, we can use this light shift. So it's a nice little exercise in the lab. And yes, it works. It's got a nice uh, level lab. Uh, but so now the, the idea is to, to see the effect on a small system of two atoms. So uh, we prepare a system of two atoms and uh, we prepare our atoms, uh, the two atoms in the 61D state. Um, and so in the state here, up, up. So if we do nothing, <coughs> we have no addressing laser. Uh, in fact, this uh, small system uh, of two atoms has four states, so you have this up, up up, down, down, and then the states up, down, and down, up, actually, since they are resonantly coupled by the dipole and interaction, they give you two uh, uh, new eigenstates, which are the symmetric and non-symmetric combination of, of those states, and they are split by twice the uh, dipole and interaction. And now, with your addressing laser, what you can do is actually change the position between those two uh, states, up, down, and down, up. Uh, if we change also, we change the position. Up, but it's not a big deal. And so it's, it's, it's something that you can explore, for example, <coughs> with microwave spectroscopy. So you start here, and for example, if you have no addressing beam, you can couple by microwave uh, to this symmetric combination here, and we have this enhancement uh, because it's a collective, uh, it's a collective coupling, just like in the regular with the uh, But now you can tune. Uh, can tune this guy with respect to this guy, and so this is here the, the light sheet that we have one. And when we do uh, microwave spectra, so on resonance we see just one line, uh, which uh, which corresponds to the fact that you transfer atoms from there to there. But if you are if you apply your light sheet, then actually you see two lines. One of them is independent of the position of the light sheet; it uh, corresponds to the transition in the atom which is not in rest. And uh, the other one that is shifted here corresponds to the position of the, of the transition in the atom, which is optically addressed. And you see also that it's kind of neat because you have this avoided crossing, but at resonance, in this uh, anti-symmetric state here just vanishes because you do not couple. So it's, uh, I, in some sense, very trivial, but it's nice to have this in the lab. And uh, one little thing that we can do uh, for free is uh, measure square root of 2 once again. Uh, just by uh, looking the, the, the different
difference into microwave uh, driven radio oscillations uh, between uh, either for a single atom or for a pair of atoms and uh, and find 1.4 as expected. Uh, okay, but so this is uh, this is not yet the, the, the real the use of the of this addressing beam. The, the idea is really to freeze the interaction, and this we do in the following way. So we start by having a little sequence to prepare the atoms in up down, and then what we'll do, either we'll do nothing, so this is what you have here. So as a function of time, you see that the probability of being in up down oscillates because you just have this resonant dipole dipole uh, interaction, which gives this spin exchange between the two atoms. But now if you apply for a given time tau uh, at some point in the sequence uh, this addressing beam, uh, you can freeze the interaction. So for example, here if you just wait half a period and switch on your beam, uh, then while the beam is on, you have no evolution of the system. And then uh, you can make the evolution resume and it starts again oscillating nicely. So it's, uh, it's really some coherent control. Nice. Uh, also, of course, what you want to do is to be able to manipulate current superpositions, and here you have to deal with some, uh, some, some something, but it's, uh, it's global. Is the fact that, uh, for example, here you stop at uh, three halves of the of a period, and uh, you, you stop the interaction, and then you let it resume. It's nice, but in fact, depending on how long you, you stay there, you accumulate a dynamic phase. So actually, you can even reverse the dynamics or you can even sort of uh, stop it, you know, uh, just because you have prepared this, uh, this kind of uh, dark state. That, I mean, at least an eigen state doesn't evolve in time. So, uh, so we think it's a, it's a nice tool. So far, it's, uh, it's we, we've done it only with two atoms, but in the future, uh, it will probably something uh, interesting for, for some applications. So recently, there was this uh, proposal of uh, quantum spin lensing, so which was more in the context of Greenberg tracing, uh, but I think we could do some kind of small demonstrations in a, in a chain of a few tens of atoms, maybe, uh, because you need to, to have this kind of local control uh, of the position of, the, of this transition. And also, this is also something which would be interesting if you want to do, for example, some studies of transport and disorder potential. Okay, and just to finish, uh, of course, as we often have the question, can you go beyond 2D? And uh, so the answer is, in fact, yes, we can. Uh, so I don't know if you can see it very well. But uh, it turns out that with a spatial light modulator, uh, it's very easy to create patterns of traps, not only in a plane, but in 3D. And people in the community of uh, you know, following particles and so on, they do it all the time. And so in particular, uh, this very nice paper, so it's a bit old and so on, it's very pedagogical, so you can have a look at that and understand that it's not <laughs> very difficult. And so uh, our postdoc Daniel, he came one weekend to the lab and he played a little bit with, with the SLM, and so this is here, so I don't know, maybe you cannot really see it, but uh, so it's a kind of bucky ball, uh, so we managed to, to make 60 traps, uh, and this is still a partially loaded array because uh, so this is just a long exposure, and we reconstruct the, the <coughs> by doing several slices. Uh, but right now, and when I say right now, it's, it's true. I'm sure they are doing this in the lab at the moment. Uh, they are trying really hard to combine this with the atom by atom assembler, basically assembling slice after slice. Uh, and it seems uh, promising and, and realistic. And I'm not saying that it will work as well as in 2D, but it, it, it will be fully cool. Thanks. and then let it evolve under this uh, coherent interaction. Do you prepare the updown state by individual pi pulse, like optical pi pulses, for a single atom to the Greenberg state and then a microwave pi pulse? Or how do you make the updown state? 
Yeah, so that's, uh, that's uh, what you said. So basically what we do, we uh, excite uh, one guy to the D stage of TC, and then uh, we apply a microwave fiber, so we hide it somehow in the D stage, and then we shift it uh, with, the, with the addressing beam so that we can uh, prepare the other one and the interaction doesn't uh, play a role during this uh, preparation. Uh, but in fact, in earlier experiments, we were doing this just like quick, so, and, and so we didn't have the addressing beam, but we could still prepare up down with a decent uh, efficiency. I mean, it's not like 99.9%, uh, it's maybe like 80% or 75%. Yes, um, is the uh the flatness of your electric field control an issue for how large an array you can get, given the sort of these really nice measurements showing how you're going to spec the electric field exactly to get the coherence law? So, so you mean do we have electric field gradients? Yeah, like does the fact that you're that a you've shown that a specific value of the electric field makes the root coherence much better, combined with this notion that of course you're going to have some profile to your electric field. Do those two in tandem mean that you actually have some new limit on the size of the array that you can get to, or is that not? No, I think, I mean, of course, there is a finite gradient, but it's pretty small. So uh, for the size of arrays that we use in the experiment, I don't think this would play a big role. <coughs> of course, it's not really zero, but this would yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's not, I mean, a much bigger issue is, for example, the, the thing that was alluded to during the talk is uh, the fact that you have uh, light shifts uh, for the excitation. Yeah. Which are in This is a much more pro problematic thing. How well are you able to measure the field? Uh, you said less than five <coughs> millivolts. Hmm? You said less than five millivolts per centimeter. Yeah, so basically, I mean, it's, uh, you know, so we, what we do, we, we just do stock mass uh, as high as we can in N, so typically we go to 100 or so, and then from the estimate of your, uh, how well you can point to the field. <coughs> The minimum of your parabola, uh, then, but that's an estimate. Right? It's, it's not a methodology. <coughs> I think it's safe. I mean, within the factor two, even better. Than, I so this three D was really cool. How do you do the imaging? They actually, I mean, this method I understand maybe, but do you shift it in and out of the imaging focus? Yeah. So so exactly. So the depth of focus of the imaging system is actually not so big. It's Um, and so what we do, we just uh, do an image of a slice here and then change to do an image of another slice like uh, yeah, the micro so the the light modulator to the no, no, 3D no. and then you move the focus? Yeah, yeah, so, but we don't do it with the spatial light modulator. Yeah, but for the trap generation. So the, the, the uh, trap generation, uh, you do everything with the SLM. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then your camera is, is fixed and we move a lens, basically. And uh, so we, we are working now with uh, computer controlled uh, lenses and polymer lenses that allow you to do this pretty fast in a couple of milliseconds. Have you ever tried to open the regime of the strong electric field in the sense of going into this kind of a linear star effect regime? And no, we haven't. Uh, I mean, yeah, it, it could be maybe interesting for some things. Uh, well, you would change interaction essentially to get dipoles from there, and all depending on what state you choose in the linear start when you form. Yeah, so this we have not done. Would it be a problem in stabilizing the electric field sufficiently? I don't think so, but to be honest, I've not really thought detail, so uh, I don't know what kind of accuracy uh, in the voltage sources we, we need as well, so, okay. but maybe we could discuss that. Uh, but would you see in the practice that the sense that this could be also involving higher angular momentum states, so in that sense? Yeah, I mean, the, clearly uh, something which would be very interesting, for example, would be to go to circular states. Uh, uh, but this, that's com the complete extreme, and I think then if you want to really benefit from circular states, it's not going to also benefit from a very long lifetime, but then it's cryogenic, so this is uh, quite, a, quite a big uh, challenge experimentally. 
But uh, yeah, I don't know. If there are some interesting things maybe to be done in some kind of intermediate regime, I mean, this, uh, this is not something we have done so far. But I don't think it's. I, mean, I don't see uh, that it would be impossible. I would be happy. I think this resonant dipole dipole interaction story is very interesting, but um, could you maybe make a comment on how realistic it is to really do many body physics in this, like fully in the Rittberg uh, manifold? So, for example, do you think it's realistic to prepare a chain where you have as an initial state up, down, up, down, up, down, with, with P and D states? No, I mean, now the first state. I think it would be realistic. With the dressing, but maybe not with the light What's the fidelity of this addressing? I mean, you need to shift everyone out of resonance and do this kind of step by step, or? I mean, then it's always a, it's always a matter of, uh, you, at some point you have to put really numbers and see what is available uh, as a laser, and so I would How would you do it? I mean, you would shift in individual atoms out of resonance and then put them up in, like, step by step? No, I and think the, the, the ideal thing to do would be to have, a, to have an, also an SLM for this uh, dressing beam and enough power to be able to apply any light shift you want on any atom, basically. We don't need a huge amount of power. Uh, but, but then this one pulse, you could bring, say, half of the chain up. But, so what is the, the thing you have in mind that you I'm just wondering, because I think the experiments you did so far with this resonant dipole dipole interaction, it always had a structure where you had at most one, say, spin, Sure. Yeah, but actually this interaction is just very strong, so it's, I think it's a matter where you can optimize, usually it's too strong, it's usually you can, like, Yeah, but it could go in some on. sense, I mean, of course, yeah. at some point you are, so you can tune it by yeah. putting the atoms far away, at some point... Uh, yes, that's, that's, that's one of the question, to what extent can one be... Well, what extent can you do actually, yeah. actually many body physics? Say I want to do spin chain, I want to, like, say, whatever, what you had to do, uh, seven mm -hmm. by seven or something like this? I, I mean... I would not say it's uh, it's straightforward, but I would not say either that it's uh, out of the question. I don't see why it would be like too ambitious. So that's the last question. Uh, yeah, just something very simple. So you showed this, uh, you saw these magic distances where uh, in, in a finite electric and magnetic field you have these different signals levels where you can cancel the blockade. Mm -hmm. But don't you run into selection of the well, so in fact, those magic distances, uh, this was uh, the, the work of Robert uh, Merge and the workers in, in King's book. So, uh, I mean, of course, they, 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 they took into account the fact that uh, the way you couple to those uh, distances is, is, is not like optimum. But still, I mean, the problem of blockade is that in principle you want zero oxidation. So, as soon as you have a little coupling, even if it's not like 100%, well, you break the blockade. So if you, for example, say to their state, they are still with magic distances, but they are much closer. So it's of course something like Okay, so now even with my, including my failed five-minute introduction, I think we are sort of pushing the limit of the you know.